Uh, thank you very much, Edie. Again, my name is Mark Chow. I think I know many of you uh, from past uh, meetings and from uh, past birding trips. And I'd like to begin by just sharing a few words about this event, uh, how uh, it came about. I think many of you know that over the last uh, 20, uh, over the last 15 years leading up to, um, leading up to 2018, I uh, led an event called the Finger Lakes Land Trust Spring Bird Quest. Actually, I guess it's more than 15 years. Anyway, um, the Finger Lakes Land Trust Spring Bird Quest, which uh, we held over Memorial Day weekend to get people out on preserves and look for birds and to uh, appreciate, to learn and to uh, contemplate the linkages among uh, these living things that we love and the habitats that sustain them and the land trust's role in uh, creating and preserving those habitats in preserving those habitats for, for the, the wildlife and for all of us. And so last year and this year, because of COVID, uh, we couldn't really hold the spring bird quest as usual. And this year in thinking about what we might do in place of the spring bird quest, which involves group bird walks, um, the land trust staff and I thought that, well, maybe we might try something different, something that would, would enable people to participate in something jointly, to share, to learn, to appreciate nature, to appreciate the preserves, uh, but also to do so in a distanced way. And that was the first ingredient. The second ingredient is that um, like many people in our community, uh, I myself uh, had been getting into iNaturalist, which is the platform that we used for this BioBlitz. iNaturalist is an online platform for uh, documenting and identifying life forms, uh, geo-tagged uh, life forms, uh, in which users take photos or recordings and uh, upload them. And the iNaturalist platform uh, uses both artificial intelligence, that is computer vision, so-called computer vision, and crowdsourced identification to help people to identify and name what they see. So I got very, very into iNaturalist uh, for insects, so much so that I became almost more interested in insects than birds, but don't tell, don't tell people um, that. And um, I uh, raised, the issue, raised, raised the idea with the land trust that we could actually conduct uh, a bio blitz, get people out to uh, land trust preserves, count what they see to uh, enter their observations and then try to compile everything. So we did that. And the result is um, what we're going to share with all of you tonight. And so I want to uh, thank uh, Edie and uh, thank other Land Trust staff, including um, Kelly McCosh and Jason Gorman, and especially Chris Ray, who is the GIS specialist who helped us to load all of the maps with the preserves into iNaturalist so that everyone seamlessly by entering their locations on the preserves with some glitches here and there, um, could, could just simply enter their sightings and thereby be part of our um, playing field, so to speak, be in the BioBlitz project. So, so that's the background here. And so let's go with some of the results. I'm gonna share my screen here. And for now, I won't share sound. Can everyone see my screen? I hope everyone can see my screen. Someone please uh, speak up. Yes, we can. Okay, super. And I'm going to go to, uh, my username is wow so many, and I'm going to go to our project here. So, um, as you can see here, we uh, collectively had 41 observers going out to uh, preserves actually a total of at least 23 preserves, land trust preserves and protected areas, uh, compiling more than 2,300 observations across 724 plus species that have so far been identified uh, with uh, the possibility of identifications of many more. So that is the overall uh, statistical range. Here's a map, I think, of the territory in which we um, collectively conducted our work. So from the Wesley Hill Preserve out in the Western Lakes to um, various preserves, many of the preserves around Ithaca, and then uh, other lesser visited preserves around uh, Owasco Lake and uh, Scanny Atlas Lake. So um, 23 preserves and collectively, I'll show you some stats now. Clicking here, on the stats, and by the way, um, 
I, I, you can find this project easily and you can find this very same information by uh, just searching the Finger Lakes Land Trust uh, June 2021 Bio Blitz in here. Uh, let's see, sorry, community projects. If you go to community and projects, you should be able to get to the same links that I'm showing you now in case you want to explore on your own later. Here are the stats. Uh, among, the 24, among the 724 species, we have mostly plants and we have, um, oops, sorry, 193 insects, which we'll um, highlight in a moment here. Hang on a second, sorry. Um, 193 insect species, 23 species of arachnids, 32 species of birds, um, maybe somewhat ironically since this originated as a bird related event or this, out, this grew out from a bird related event. It's just hard to take pictures of birds. And while people did some sound recordings, I think uh, plants and insects and other uh, microfauna for which photography is particularly well suited uh, ended up being the stars of the show. Uh, fungi 48 species, uh, protozoan six species. You may be wondering, how do people document protozoans? I believe that these are mostly or all uh, slime molds. Other animals, which would include, I'll show you here, um, millipedes and, um, and uh, wood lice and uh, centipedes, etc. I think earthworms, somebody uh, photographed a common earthworm as well. And uh, six reptile species. So you get a sense of the diversity here. And so um, that's the summary. I emphasize to you, and I think you probably under, we all understand that this is really just a snapshot. It's not like a comprehensive inventory. If we tried to do a comprehensive inventory, who knows how many multiples of 724 species we might find. But the purpose of this really is to, as I said before, get out to learn, to appreciate these creatures, to maybe be awed by these creatures, and then to uh, contemplate the linkages between these things that uh, amaze us and uh, amuse us and entertain us and with, with, with whom we share our, our, our region and our planet, and to contemplate that as well as to contemplate the land trust role in protecting their habitats. So enough from me. I think um, we uh, have, as I said, the stars of the show are the uh, flora and the fauna and the fungi. And so tonight, uh, I've asked several uh, BioBlitz participants, several um, particularly prolific BioBlitz participants who are also experts in uh, notable taxa to uh, share highlights. And so um, I'll introduce them now. Um, we have David McShane, who is the president of the Rochester, of the Rochester Area uh, Mycological Association. We have Marla Coppolino, who is a scientist and illustrator and author and an expert and promoter of uh, land snails and slugs. And Jason Dombrowski, who is the collections manager of the Cornell Insects Collection, Cornell University Insect Collection. And so um, I would like, I guess, first to uh, invite David to uh, share your uh, highlights and to share just a, a, a bit of uh, background information too about um, fungi on land trust property. David McShane. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for the introduction, Mark. I am sharing a link to my slide deck here in the chat as well. Uh, there is a little bit of information in the presenter notes there if anybody wants to refer back to it as well as like links to the specific observations that I'm referring to with these pictures so that you can tie it back to specific information. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. And pop this over into presentation mode. Awesome. Does that show up all right for everybody? Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Yes, all right. So I'm David McShane. You can find me on iNaturalist Z0111. Nice, short, and easy to remember username. Please tag me in all of your fungi. I'm happy to hear about them. I try to review everything that shows up in all of Greater New York at least once a week. And I'm trying to keep up with a couple of my peers. We have a really great time making a game out of identifying as many fungal observations in the area as we can. Uh, I am a part of the Rochester Area Mycological Association. We're a group that leads fungal walks in the greater Rochester area. We focus on education and table identification, but we also work with any bio blitz or similar type of activity where we can go out into new properties and explore and ex 
expand the fungal diversity understanding that we have in New York. Uh, our members have contributed to new species descriptions, to herbarium collections at Cornell and Buffalo State, and a whole bunch of other really cool things. So we were really excited when we saw an opportunity here to hop on board and to go out to some new properties. Uh, a lot of the preserves were new properties to all of our members. We do have a couple of members that are also part of the Finger Lakes Land Trust organization, but Wesley Hill, especially where we did a foray uh, on Saturday, the 12th of the bio blitz, we had about a dozen members come out and we took a look at a bunch of fungi. So real quick, what's a mushroom? It's a little cap and a stem thing, looks kind of like a plant that's in the ground, right? Well, they're a little bit more than that. And you're gonna see through a lot of our pictures that we touch and handle our, and disturb our subjects a little bit more than you're probably used to with a lot of plants and animals, especially uh, where touching them and disturbing them is a little more sensitive. I just wanna call real quick attention to the idea that most of a fungal organism is an underground root-like network of hyphae. And that's what the real uh, living organism is. The mushrooms that we pick and examine are more akin to like, apples on a tree or fruiting bodies. And they're created in order to distribute spores. Many of them actively want to become food or act like berries and spread seeds or spores in the case of fungi this way. So when we're disturbing them, we're kind of helping them, but it's kind of important for us too to get accurate identifications. Because sometimes these little details that might be partly buried in the ground, really kind of important to us to get good and accurate identification. So before we go on, a quick left turn into the Mycetozoa. We mentioned that we had some protists, right? Well, like, how'd those wind up in my fungi presentation, you might ask? Turns out that when you're looking at these little bitty things on logs, like we tend to do as mycologists, that you tend to look at all of them. And these protists like to hang out in kind of similar wet, moist, damp habitat with lots of like dead plant material too. So we found two different classes of, myce of um, protists across five orders, six families, and about eight genera. And here are some great picture representations of most of the different groups. We found a bunch of duplicates of a lot of these. Uh, starting at the top left, we have what's called the raspberry slime mold. These are fun. Uh, Steminitis, which is a chocolate tube slime mold in the middle. A tricky L. We only identify those little red guys in the top right corner down to the order level. That's a pretty high taxonomic level. These guys are really, really complicated and turns out they all kind of look like salmon eggs on a log. Uh, so these are ones that will actually sometimes take home, get into the microscopy, and you've really got to dig into these guys because there's hundreds and hundreds of species that to the naked eye look all really kind of similar. Another really common one continuing clockwise that big yellow guy on a log there, that's Fuligo septica. Uh, you might know it as the scrambled egg or the dog vomit slime mold even. Some of these have kind of creative common names. Uh, and these guys start out as plasmodium. They're all these little tiny single celled organisms. They gather all up into these interesting colony structures that we use to identify them. They fruit, they send spores off into the air or into the surroundings, and then they cycle around like that. The last guy in the bottom left is interesting. He's Ceratiomyxa. He's the only one that's actually in a whole separate class from all the rest of the myxomycetes here. And he grows, looks like little teeny tiny white honeycomb. That whole picture is only about an inch across. And I'm gonna hop out of present mode for a second because I just wanna show you guys something real quick. I've put accessibility text in here. So if you pull up the accessibility text, you can see the names and the link to the specific observation in this if you refer to it in the future. So that's just here is the alternative text. So if you wanna come back and check out what any of this stuff was or remember a note or an anecdote or something that I'm talking about in a little bit, you can find it there. On to the fungi. And I need to move my people window out of the way here a little bit. There we go, okay. So we found two phyla of fungi across six classes, 14 orders, 35 families, and 50 genera. A lot of the fungi that we found, we only ID'd down to family or genera level because uh, they're kind of complicated. And I'll talk a little bit more detail about some of those as we go along here. And so that's why you'll notice that we actually have more genera level IDs than we do species level IDs. Because in a lot of cases, these observations are pretty easy to get to a higher taxonomic level. 
but with these near microscopic or microscopic organisms, it can be hard to put accurate species level IDs on them. I broke the rest of this into six slides for the six uh, group, large groups of fungi that we found, starting with the rusts. The common rusts here, my, hmm, I'm just gonna leave my presentation notes up here because it's a little easier for me than jumping back and forth on this bigger screen. So the one that we found during the bio blitz is Gymnosporangium globosum. Rusts are kind of cool because they spend their life cycle in two different hosts. We see this one during this time of year during the bio blitz here on juniper plant or on hawthorn plants rather. And then later on in the year, it hops hosts over to junipers and grows these little squid looking ball things on the fruiting parts of junipers. What's interesting about this and why we kind of care about this, especially from like conservation and observation and inventory practices, is that a lot of the close relatives of these are uh, plant parasites and they do a lot of crop damage or can do a lot of crop damage if you don't pay attention to them and think about these things. Apple farmers know not to plant ornamental cedar near their apple farms because of a similar rust like this that will infect and take out all of their apples. So as we're doing these inventories and as we're conserving land near agricultural properties or vice versa, we want to think about what we see there in these natural flora and fauna because when organizations come along and they say, we want to help the plant parasites or, hey, our farmers aren't doing terribly well. We want to be able to give them information like this. So citizen scientists like us can say, hey, we observed this rust a lot in this particular preserve. Maybe the neighboring farmer should just pick a different grain crop and they'll have a lot better time. Um, that's not really my area of expertise. I know that it's something the Cornell Cooperative Extension works with constantly. Uh, and this is one of the areas where we actually do a, a fair amount of contributing is in rust surveying and seeing these kind of things out there so that farmers especially can make uh, different choices about what kind of grains to plant based on what's in the forests and the wild lands around them. The next large group of fungi that we found or this are the Sordariomycetes. The one on the bottom is kind of cool. This is a Xylaria species. These guys are everywhere this year. It's been a little wetter than it's been the last two years. And these guys are saprobes. They're digesting uh, light plant material. So like the dead leaves from last year and that like top layer of detritus on the ground. These are some of the first decomposers that come in and decompose that stuff. Uh, I get asked about these a lot because they really, their common name is dead man's fingers. Then sometimes when you get a four or five fat one sneaking out from under a log, they really kind of do live up to their name. They're interesting because like the Kretschmaria on top that we had a few observations of, it's a common tree parasite that lives the first half of its year in this asexual stage with this nice gray and white soft squishy form. And then later in the year will live up to its common name, the brittle cinder fungus and become almost like lumps of charcoal on the ground. And then it starts producing sexual haploid ascospores and reproducing with other organisms in its vicinity. And so we uh, as a group as Rama spend a lot of time looking at these because we find the life cycles and the symbiosis that fungi create really interesting. And that kind of brings me to our next big group of fungi, which are the lichens, Lechenoromycetes. We found a handful of these and a couple that I thought were really cool. I'm actually gonna start on the right. I didn't even see this uh, observation initially until I went back to look at uh, them again, creating these slides. A lot of times these lichens are really, really difficult to ID because the pictures we get are kind of generic, like green blobby stuff. And we might be missing some of the really fine details. So this pink earth lichen, Diabius baeomyces, is really cool. It grows these teeny tiny, each of these is about a half a centimeter tall, little pink stalked reproductive ASCII. And they'll just show up. They grow on open ground and open terrain. So you'll be just going along in a bare mossy hillside. All these little pinks, it's like somebody spilled a bottle of sprinkles. It's really that bright pink. They're really interesting because they are both a uh, symbiote because lichen are a fungus and an algae or cyanobacteria working together in kind of a symbiosis. Or in some cases, maybe the algae is not getting a lot back from the lichen, but 
their thallus, their bodies also act as nanobiomes for whole schools of other microbes. So there's a whole field of study that is just looking at all the little microorganisms that show up inside the thallus of this peltagera, this wolf lichen here that we found in the middle. This one's kind of a neat one, and I don't know what species it is. I actually asked a couple of other area experts about this one, because seeing this very black with purple edged one is kind of uncommon. Um, so I was going to look into this one more, but we hadn't really got a lot of great information about it beyond the genus level. And then my last highlight for this group is the smoky-eyed boulder lichen. A lot of the lichens that we see, especially because we have a lot of big exposed rock in the region, are these very crustose. A lot of times they look very plain. You might not even notice it's anything except for a slightly discolored region on the rock. But every once in a while, they start putting up these assi, these little round reproductive structures. And that's what we use to identify them mostly. This one is really unique because a lot of times you've got to go down to microscopy, you've got to look at the spores and they're kind of difficult to ID. But this one's unique in the field because it always has this little black edge line around each of these little circle objects. None of the other similar lichens have that color combination. So if you see that like smoky eye, you know, just like a makeup kind of touch, then that's your Poripoidea albocaru lessons. On to the next group. We're getting into the bigger, more colorful stuff. Uh, these were a couple of my favorites. So I actually grew up about a mile and a half from Van, the Van Riper Winkler Preserve. And since that's opened, it's become one of my absolute favorite properties in the Finger Lakes Land Trust group of properties. Uh, a couple of these were ones that we found there. Starting here, this is Sarcoscypha occidentalis. This is a little ascomycete, a little stalked red cup that we actually had a, I think it was seven or eight observations of this mushroom. Uh, it is actually on the cover of one of our common field identification books for fungus in the Northeast United States. And you might not even notice that it's more than this little red cup because it's also a saprobe digesting leaf matter here. And we find a lot of these under our, our broadleaf trees, oaks and beech and maples even, uh, and just eating the leaves. And they'll show up in the early spring uh, around May. They're really only out for a few weeks of the year. Unlike their kind of similar looking cousin here, uh, the Scutellinia. These guys have little eyelashes and it's the easiest way to differentiate them from other red cups. You can kind of see these little eyelash structures, or it might almost look like teeth a little bit on the ridge. We also found quite a few pizziza. These are your common cup fungi. You'll see these in mulch beds. You'll see these in gardens, sandboxes, all over the place. Uh, there's even a species that will grow in your basement on a wet mop if it stays wet enough for a couple of weeks. Uh, and that's the, the type species for this family of mushrooms, the uh, operculate ascomycetes. We found a morel all the way in June. It doesn't look much like a morel, but it is a really close relative of the morels that are the known choice edible mushrooms. We don't usually talk too much about those though. Uh, Dischiota venosa, the veined cup. These are really cool. Uh, buttermilk actually has a location that has a massive field of these that people like to take cool photos of. Uh, they usually show up earlier in May. So it was interesting with the kind of warming, cooling spring to see some of these out as late as June. And then possibly my favorite hit of the fungi for the whole foray uh, of the whole weekend was this Helvola elastica. So there are only eight observations of this fungi in the whole state so far. And two of them were from the Van Riper Winkler Preserve. Uh, one of them was mine uh, from this weekend, from the BioBlitz here. But it might actually be even rarer. There are six... Uh, varieties, subspecies of this mushroom that are described. Two of them were described by Charles Peck, a mycologist from Cornell. And there's not a whole lot of data around about them because they were described around about 100 years ago before we had DNA, before microscopy was nearly as good. So this was actually the only fungus that we collected and that we're going to sequence uh, for genetic information because we're trying to help uh, the community as citizen scientists build modern concepts of what these varieties mean. Because right now we kind of just think of them as color differences 
but we know from Peck's descriptions that there's probably more to it. So we're trying to create a, a genetic picture of what these variations really mean within the species. So that was kind of cool. It is our, our citizen science opportunity to maybe contribute something meaningful here. Uh, moving on quickly here, we've got the agaricomycetes. These are your common ones. We have a little less than them, a little bolete in the top left corner there. Merasmius rotula. These are little tiny mushrooms with, you can see the interesting connection. It's almost like a pinwheel here. Its gills aren't really connected to the stem. They're connected to that little wheel in there. Trichaptums. These are bright purple blobs that you're starting to see on trees, especially like down medium-sized branches. And throughout the year, they'll grow out into little purple brackets, but they maintain this purple toothy structure. We have a couple of species. We identified two different species during the bio blitz, and uh, you can pick them out based on hardwood or conifer trees, but they're always going to have that little bit of a purple color to them. We did find some oyster mushrooms, some pleurotus mushrooms, and then also some Artemisis pixidatus, coral mushrooms. Uh, there's a bunch of different families and genus. We identified three coralloid mushrooms. That's mushrooms that are shaped kind of like these terrestrial corals across two genera uh, and three species. And then an Amanita. These are your classic fairy tale, like Mario mushroom mushrooms. They come in a huge variety of colors and combinations. And these are mycorrhizal. These are some of our forest managers that help trees self-thin and self-manage to create healthy canopies. And this was kind of cool because something that we see in years when trees are under stress is that they're mycorrhizal partners. These mushrooms that are living in symbiosis with them and helping them manage and broker for nutrients around the forest are uh, showing up this year, even under all the stress from things like the gypsy moth caterpillars and what have you, where we're a little worried about our tree. So it was really encouraging for me to see these fruiting bodies out there of these mycorrhizal partners, because that was a great indicator to me that despite some apparent stressors that the trees are still doing okay for the most part. And then the last one is the one that I wanna send home with you that everybody can take home and be able to identify. It's this blue wood over here. You've probably seen this in the woods before and maybe wondered what it was, maybe thought it was like trail paint or something down. So this is Chlorocyboria. And it is a little tiny green cup fungus. Chloro means green and cybor means cup that isn't often seen as a fruit body, but is frequently seen as this blue wood in the woods, right? So over the next month, six weeks or so, this is gonna be coming into season. So you've got an opportunity to take some kind of cool and get a fairly rare iNaturalist picture. There's a bunch of observations of this blue wood, but only about a dozen observations in New York State of these little green cup fungus. So we did find some blue wood during the bio blitz. We didn't find the green cup fungus yet but there'll be a lot of opportunities as you're out around the properties over the next six weeks to look out for that little green cup fungus and that that's one you can get up on INAT and that we'd love to see more pictures of the fruiting body because it's thought to be pretty rare in the area. And that was fungus uh, during the bio blitz. I'm gonna stop sharing there. David, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to um, ask everyone to hold your questions uh, until the end, or you can put them in the chat uh, so that we can move on to uh, other subject matter and then uh, discuss everything at the end. Um, so next would be Marla Coppolino. Hi, everyone. Thanks for that great presentation, David. Uh, I can have a nice segue. Uh, so I'll be talking about snails and slugs. And do you know, uh, most of our na locally native snails and slugs feed on fungi. Uh, they'll eat the fruiting body, uh, or what we call the mushroom, uh, and some uh, specialize in lichens, and some even eat slime molds too. So uh, something interesting uh, that I, I love so many aspects of uh, um, ecology, these little interactions that are still yet poorly understood, but there are a very small handful of papers out there observing that the snails and slugs uh, are um, instrumental in carrying, transporting spores from fungi to other locations and allowing them to propagate. And in some cases, when snails and slugs consume 
uh, part of a fruiting body and thus part of the spores, the spores are not going to be viable until they've gone through the dig digestive tract of the snail or slug and come out the other end. So how cool is that? So I'm going to introduce you a little bit to snails and slugs in my talk here. I'm going to share my screen so I can show you my presentation. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. Uh, how's that look for everybody? Give me a thumbs up, Mark. Super, Marla. Looks, good. Looks okay, great. Great. I'm going to make sure. All right. So uh, snails and, and slugs, I'll give you a quick, some quick overview first. Uh, so we're talking about mollusks. Mollusk, uh, it, uh, mollusca is the phylum that includes everything from the shells that you find on the beach that were made by animals that are made by mollusks, uh, uh, as well as octopus, squid, uh, also our aquatic, uh, our freshwater aquatic um, snails and land snails that breathe air just like you and I do. That's the uh, part that's most interesting to me are the gastropods of land. Uh, so gastropod is a class of snails and slugs. Slugs are basically snails without a shell. Okay, uh, they've just evolved not to have one. Snails are born or say <laughs> hatched <laughs> from an egg uh, and they have their shell with them. The shell continually grows with them for life. Think of the shell of a snail like your fingernail grows with you, uh, whereas slugs do not have a shell. Okay, uh, in New York state alone, we have 115 or so species of land snails and slugs. There are over a thousand or so in North America uh, um, United States and Canada. So uh, that's actually more snails and slugs of the lands than there are bird species. Uh, fortunately, most of our snails and slugs are native, that they evolved here. And those are the ones that will not eat your garden. It's the pest snails that give uh, this, our, our local snails and slugs a bad rap. So the first thing that happens when you say snail to somebody is they think, oh no, those things that are eating up all my broccoli or uh, zinnias or whatever. No, those are introduced accidentally from Europe, from Asia. They don't have enough uh, natural enemies here. So they proliferate and they will eat anything. Whereas our native snails and slugs are specialized, like I said, on fungi and, um, uh, decaying vegetation in the woodland, most of them. Uh, I'm quite pleased to tell you this slug at the bottom of the screen is a mantle slug. I believe Jason had found this one. It's one of the Phylomyca species. It might be um, what we call the Carolina mantle slug. I need uh, maybe a, another photo of the top to be sure. They're, uh, the mantle slugs are hard to tell apart, but they're a lovely native slug of our woodlands here. All right, so here's a quick overview. Only 1.53% of all our Finger Lakes Land Trust BioBlitz observations were mollusks. But how important they are. They're, these animals are at the bottom of the food web. So there are so many other animals that rely on them for food. If you like fireflies, you ought to thank snails and slugs because many species of fireflies when they're uh, in their larval phase are consuming snails and slugs. So great. Yes, um, so we had a total of 33 observations of mollusks, uh, 11 species, nine observers altogether. Okay, and these are some of them. I'm gonna highlight, unfortunately, the most commonly observed land mollusk was the Western dusky slug, which is invasive. And they're bloody everywhere. They're in my garden. They're uh, unfortunately on a lot of the land trust preserves. Uh, I've noticed something interesting about them though, when I'm on the preserves, that I'll find them at the edges. So near the parking lot, the roadside, closer to there. But when you go deeper into the preserve, you find less of them. So that's a good thing. 
Okay, so um, this first, this is so funny, I can't, can't see this. Okay, this was Salmon Creek sanctuary, uh, Bird Sanctuary. Um, as much as I wanted to, I couldn't really penetrate the woods because it was overgrown with poison ivy. There was quite a bit of wild parsnip on the side of the road and I got about five ticks per foot uh, uh, on me as I walked through. So I didn't get very deep into there, but I skirted the edges of the preserve, of uh, the sanctuary. Uh, lovely bird calls, for sure. I got some recordings. But um, my favorites uh, of this area was the blunt amber snail. Um, now you're looking at that saying, oh, I see those all the time. Well, actually you might be seeing, look right below it, the European snail, uh, because uh, we happen to have a lot of uh, these invasive European amber snails in this area too. But uh, one of the notable differences is that the blunt amber snail has a, a more elongated shell. The whorls, the, the um, spiral is a, a, a bit more elongated and the whole shell has more of an orange color. Uh, most of the amber snails, we have about actually eight or nine, maybe 10 species of amber snails in New York state alone. So uh, they're very hard to tell apart. Usually uh, if you wanna get a good feeling for, for how hard they are to tell apart. Some of the shells look exactly like you can only tell with molecular diagnostics. So looking at the DNA. Anyway, um, I was quite happy to find the blunt amber snail. Unfortunately, the other two invasive species I found near the edges of this preserve, around the edges of this preserve were the hairy snail, which is introduced from Europe and Asia. Uh, it does have hairs. This individual was uh, dead, so the shell persists in, in the environment for a while. Uh, little hairs wear off. And the other is, yes, you guessed it, a Western dusky slug. No fun. Um, uh, but a lot of birds eat snails. And since there are so many birds, uh, uh, one of the birds, uh, notable birds um, that I heard at this location was the wood thrush and wood thrush and, and uh, all the thrushes eat snails. If you ever go through the woods and you see a tree stump or a rock or something with smashed bits of snail shell, a wood thrush has been there or uh, one of the other thrushes has been there. And what they do is they take the snail and they beat it against the rock or the log or the tree stump to get the yummy mushy bits, but they don't like to eat the shells. Some other birds do like to eat the shells. So that, that was, the Salmon uh, Creek. Okay, next. Uh, so the other preserve that I visited was uh, my favorite, Ellis Hollow. And there's an abundance of native snails there. All the snails that you see in this top row are in the family Polygyridae. Oh, no, I take that back. The, the three on the right are in the family Polygyridae. The one on the left, the pyramid dome snail is in the family Zonididae. Uh, the difference is these polygyridae snails all have a reflected lip. Uh, so this, um, I'm pointing to it and that does absolutely no good on this Zoom presentation. The, uh, the aperture, the opening of where the snail comes out, that's a little, there's a little reflected lip there. So you can see that. Yeah, uh, really nice to find these, the polygyridae Gyrid snails are uh, denizens of woodland. They are found under decaying logs in the leaf litter and they feed on decaying vegetation and fungi. The pyramid dome snail uh, is a little different. It's also found in those same locations, but their diet is a little more on the generalist side than the polygyrid snails. And the ventrogen snail, sorry, the pyramid dome snail is a common name, uh, can be found uh, on bones. If, if there's a, 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 a dead animal, they'll, they'll be the cleanup crews and they like to scrape bones or deer antlers or even the shells of other snails that have been eaten by a beetle or something else. The pyramid dome snail will come along and clean out the rest of that. So that's pretty cool. We have some invasive snails also found at Ellis Hollow. 
but they were, like I said, all closer to the entrance. I didn't find any of these in the woods, but uh, the glossy pillar snail, that was a very poor specimen, but it was almost deteriorated, deteriorated the uh, shell. Uh, was rather old. Uh, hairy snails are abundant around the parking lot and the western dusky sl slug again unfortunately is there and everywhere. Okay, advance the slide. Okay, um, so I'm gonna sum up here. Um, if you've enjoyed my presentation so far though, I am coming back to the Finger Lakes Land Trust via Zoom, coming to your living room or kitchen or office. Uh, in August, I'll, I'll let Edie remind us of the date of that because I can't seem to remember right now, but I'll give a full length snail and slug presentation then. Anyway, snails are abundant. They're out there more than you know. They're all, all over under our feet, but they're a challenge to find. And most of our native snails and slugs are, I like to say smaller than a ladybug, but really smaller than four or five millimeters at the greatest shell width. And I have a little uh, snail to show you here. I'm going to see how this this works out. I need to see my my own self. To, okay, here we go. So, okay, this is a little. Um, it's called a paleo slide, but it's um, just a, a foam slide with a slip cover, and there's a tiny snail in there. Can you see that? It's just a speck. It looks like sand. Yeah, that's a snail. So, if you're really going to look for small snails, this is your search image. And what we usually do as a malacologist, that's somebody who likes to study snails, we collect leaf litter and decaying vegetation from the forest floor, shake it out through sieves, and then spend a long time looking and picking out tiny snails from that. Something I'd like to do. I want to see if there's any need for permits to do that on the land trust properties. Anyway, so that's why they're hard to find. So I found the big ones. And others who participated in this bioblitz bio blitz found big ones. Uh, the highest diversities is, are places like Ellis Hollow Nature Preserve and mixed hardwood forests. A lot of beech trees helps. Beech trees, their leaves are very high in calcium and many species of snails do better in areas with a lot of calcium. The cool thing about snails, unlike other animals, maybe you, are, you can do this with other animals, but the shells persist in the environment for a while. So if you find empty shells and you can identify them, do it. Yeah. Uh, too many invasive. Aryan slugs, that's the dusky um, slugs that we keep finding. Um, so I wanted to leave you with this. For future bio blitzes or any future snail photos that you want to take and upload to iNaturalist, it's very good if you can get two or three photos with the different shell views. You see those on the right of the screen. Everybody likes to take that, what they call the top view. And that's, that's um, pretty standard, but I could not identify it if I didn't have also the underside or the umbilical view and the apertural view of the opening. It's those three really help. Even then, there are a lot of snails that look alike from the shells and they're difficult to identify and some hybridize. So it's, it's um, in some cases I could only get down to the genus level and not the species. Um, and for slugs, uh, as per the bottom here, two photos is great, uh, a top photo and on the right side, you're asking why the right side and not the left? Well, the breathing pore is located on the right side of the slug, not the left. They only have one breathing pore. We have two nostrils, they have one, right? So um, sometimes the little area around the breathing pore is actually part of what helps IAO, right? I'm gonna leave you with something that will help you remember how lovely and beautiful snails are. Uh, this is a little video I took in Ellis Hollow Nature Preserve of one of the ventridins or the pyramid dome snails that I found. It happens that their shell is translucent enough that you can actually see the snail's heart beating. How special is that? Snails have a two-chambered heart, and you can see it's ventricle and um, uh, pumping, actually. So let me just play this video. So again, I can't point to the screen, but if you look at the whirl of the shell, it's located right about the 10, yeah, maybe 10, 11 o'clock position. Uh, there's something pumping in there, right? 
So the snail itself is kind of active and halfway out the shell. I'll play it one more time. Um, and it's really funny because I was so excited that my heart was beating. So I couldn't really hold my little cell phone still. But uh, that snail displays <laughs> a nice example of a beating heart of a snail. So just to let you know, these little guys, even the tiniest, tiniest ones like the one that you see here, which is just an empty shell in, in here, also has a beating heart. There you go. So Marla, that is everyone. so awesome. That is great. Thank you so much um, for the whole presentation and for that, uh, that uh, incomparable parting shot of the, uh, of the beating heart and of just a very striking, beautiful snail. All right. So um, uh, we have more to get through um, and time is uh, moving and well, we have just a lot more excitement to come. So let's uh, go to Jason, please. All right. Um, I had the fortunate and unfortunate task about talking about the cool insects that were found and there was no shortage. There was a lot of species. So I'm just gonna share my screen and get to my presentation here. Share, all right, hopefully that works. Um, so basically, my approach was, uh, except for the first two I'll talk about, is basically go through a list of all the species that were seen. And if in my head I said, oh, wow, uh, it got a check mark. And if I made an audible, oh, wow, it got two check marks. Um, and I made a big list, kept all the two check mark ones and a few of the one check mark ones. And that's what we'll talk about. But first, let's go. Let's see here. So summary, we had 534 observations overall of arthropods. So insects, arachnids, which include spiders, mites, uh, harvestmen, et cetera, uh, crustaceans, um, and uh, what am I missing here? Oh, myriapods, which are the centipedes and millipedes. Of the most diverse groups, as far as people saw for species, we had 46 species of moths and butterflies, 38 beetles, 28 flies, 25 hymenoptera, the ants, bees, and wasps, and 20 dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, and the number in parentheses at the end there uh, are the number of observations of each. So I'm going to start with the most observed species, and I'm sure nobody will be surprised by this one. Uh, about half the people saw gypsy moths. Uh, I'm sure everybody saw them, uh, but about half people documented it. They're having a good year in the Finger Lakes region. Uh, we had 21 observations of it, and it's in no doubt every single reserve. Uh, and some reserves will have a lot more than others. Um, now, basically, they're non-native species. They're outbreaking. They're causing a lot of defoliation. Um, luckily, if the trees are healthy, they'll come right back from it, even after several years of defoliation. I'm not going to say too much more about gypsy moths, but if you do want to learn more about gypsy moths, here's my plug. I will be talking about the Finger Lakes uh, moths in a few weeks, and I am changing my talk to have a whole section on gypsy moths and gypsy moth outbreaks. Uh, so stay tuned for that if you want to learn about gypsy moths and other cool moths. All right, now as far as native species, the most observed native species was the little wood satyr. This is a little brownish butterfly. It's very common right now, and it's one of those butterflies that um, if you learn how to recognize butter, butterflies by their flight patterns, this is a very easy one. And basically what happens is they've got a very choppy flight. So it looks like they're kind of bouncing. They're very kind of slow motion. They like somewhat open areas with some woods nearby. The larvae feed on grasses, a variety of different grasses. Um, and we had 11 observations of this. As far as that very floppy flight, once you get used to it, it's pretty, it sticks out pretty well. There's only one other butterfly in our area that's common, uh, that, that's about that size, that looks like that. And that's the next one I'm gonna talk about. Um, and this um, is a species called common ringlet. Now, the reason why I bring this one up is it's interesting because if you were looking for this butterfly, let's say in the early 1900s, you would not see it in this area at all. In fact, you'd have to go to Northern Europe or Asia where it's native or far Western US in the Rockies and some of the Alpine areas or the high Arctic of Canada. It was an open species that likes open grasses that the caterpillars feed on. And then for whatever reason, 
It just started to move south in the 1900s. By about 1950, it got into central Ontario, following highways, uh, railways, and uh, tra uh, electrical transmission uh, right of ways. And by the 1990s, got into far northern New York. And it didn't show up in the Finger Lakes until 2016, around there, give or take a year or two. Um, and right now, it is a very common butterfly. If you have an open field with grasses in it, you will have common ringlet. And again, same sort of flight as the previous species, uh, the little woodsader, a very floppy, uh, jumpy flight that's very easy to pick out, even with binoculars from a distance. Um, here's another interesting one. Now, this one is a little less of a surprise, but if, if uh, you weren't from the area, this might be a very exciting uh, uh, cricket. It's called Davis's shieldback. Now, Davis's shieldback, uh, I've got a map on the left there of iNaturalis observations. That's pretty much its global distribution. It's found in one small part of Oak Savannah in southern Ontario, and then a few scattered ridgetops uh, throughout New York State. Uh, and there's a few other sites known just south and just northeast of us, but that's essentially it. It's a very localized species. Um, and if anyone ever wants to see this species, which is a pretty, pretty sizable cricket, it's flightless, it's omnivorous as well, so it feeds on plants and animals, whatever is available. Um, the place to go is Steege Hill. Um, Steege Hill is probably my favorite reserve overall for biodiversity. It's got a lot of interesting things, and you'll see a lot of the highlights I've gotten in today's talk are from Steege Hill. Uh, at this point, I should also mention that you're going to see a lot of the photographs I've chosen for this presentation were taken by Jeremy Coles, Collinson, or Brandon Wu. That's partially because they, they provided over 30% of the observations of arthropods in this, this uh, uh, bio blitz, but also because they're both very good naturalists and really like to focus on obscure and really cool insects. And they know when they find something really cool. Another one that, that Jeremy found with Brandon at Steege Hill, again, that cool spot, uh, is the crested pygmy grasshopper. This one's not quite as rare. It's pretty widespread, but it's very localized. It likes drier sort of hilltop dry habitats. Um, and it's just this tiny little stubby grasshopper. This is a full-sized adult. It's about a centimeter long, and they just look like an armored tank. They're absolutely bizarre little critters. Uh, not much is known about them because they're kind of hard to find. Uh, but the more common species tend to live on the edges of puddles and graze on algae. This one probably is a, a lichen grazer, uh, but we really don't know much about it. All right, then we get to the river jewelwing. Um, this is an interesting species that we're sort of on the edge of the range for it. If you go north, it becomes much, much more common in smaller streams, but down here it's just found in localized streams. Uh, Ganung uh, Nature Preserve is a known spot for it, but I had to get a picture of this because it's, it's just pretty unusual to see down here, except right there. Um, you might be more familiar with its close relative, the ebony jewel wing, which looks just like that, the males, except the wings are completely black. Uh, and, and this time of year, they're absolutely abundant up now. I can see over a dozen in my backyard right now. The males are out displaying for females, and they sort of flop around with a very distinctive flight, usually over small creeks, uh, but they sometimes venture away from creeks. And to show off how strong they are for females, they first of all show their brilliant iridescent colors in their abdomen, but they also show off how strong they are by holding two wings and flying only with the other sets. So they're basically flying with only half their equipment. This was a surprise for me. I did not expect to see this. Uh, we've got a lot of different species of ground beetles in New York, and they're quite well known. They're quite well studied. We've had a, quite a number of ground beetle experts that have uh, worked at Cornell and surrounding areas for over 100 years. So we know them well, but this was a surprise. This is a ground beetle called Dichelus teeter. Uh, it's a species I've never seen. It occurs mostly southern Appalachians up into Pennsylvania. We've got a lot of historical records for the southern tier, but as far as you can tell, no recent records for New York State. Uh, this is the first record on iNaturals for New York State, so quite a significant find. These guys are predatory. If you look at the big hunk and jaws in that thing, uh, they'll devour whatever they can from uh, caterpillars to earthworms to slugs to whatever they can mangle. Um, they're pretty powerful hunters. And if you ever want to see how common ground beetles are, all you need to do is go out at night with a headlamp and shine around on the ground. If you see 
eight eyes staring back at you, that's a spider. If you see two eyes staring back at you, it's a ground beetle. And you'll see they're absolutely abundant. During the day, they're hiding under leaf litter uh, and rocks. This one is probably the coolest uh, one for me um, from a professional end of it. Uh, and I'll try to tell you why. This is what's called a mandibulate moth, uh, Epimartria oricrinella. And this species, I've first of all never seen it in New York. I've only seen it um, in Newfoundland. Um, but it's such a weird, basically living fossil for moths. If I were to make an analogy with mammals, it'd be like finding a duckbill platypus. You know, they're weird, they lay eggs, they have all these weird structures that most mammals don't have. This moth is the platypus of the moth world. Basically, so most moths have a coiled proboscis, which they drink fluids with. This doesn't have it. This group diverged off before probos the proboscis evolved. They have mandibles, they chew pollen and, and fern spores. Uh, they've got just all these weird, bizarre structures that you don't find in any other moth groups. So they're basically this living fossil. And I've always wanted to find one in New York. I've looked really hard and I've not been able to find it. Of course, Jeremy and Brandon found one at Steech Hill. No surprise, they always find the good stuff. Um, now, I've also got a plant picture there. Yes, I know it's not an insect, uh, but when you're looking for some of these specialized insects, you've got to know their habitat. And this moth is a specialist. The larva feeds only on this one type of liverwort uh, called Bazania trilobata. And someone did get it um, during the bio blitz, not at Steech Hill, but elsewhere. So this moth could be at, at that reserve as well. This liverwort kind of looks like a moss. It forms hummocks in, in cold, damp forests. Um, and uh, the, by the way, the larva of this, this moth is totally like any caterpillar you can picture. Picture uh, Jabba the Hutt with a small head and lots of scattered bristles. And that's this caterpillar. It looks like a little snot that's tapered on each end. It's really a weird, really weird moth that I can't explain without getting into a lot of detail. Here's another one. This one I was very surprised at. Uh, this is a twirler moth, which is a very large family here of usually very difficult to identify moths. This is one of the easier ones to identify, Polyphysis emblemella. This is a species I've never seen anywhere. It's pretty sporadic. It's found pretty widespread uh, right down to Texas. Um, and we have a bunch of records for New York State, but the most recent one was 1918. Uh, so this is really quite a find. Uh, it's something that I thought was long gone from the state. Um, and again, Steech Hill, surprise, surprise, uh, and Jeremy found it. Um, but I, I put a quote here, one of Jeremy's comments when I told him how cool this was, uh, is he described the behavior of it. Uh, it had a funny little dance going in circles one way and then the other with a pause before starting up again. And that just goes to explain the common name for this group of moths, the twirler moth, because when they land, they just will spin around for a while until they finally settle down. I don't really know why they do it. I think it might be to confuse predators, but who knows? All right, um, this one, this was by Mark. Um, and this was a species of robber fly I've never seen before. There's a lot of different species of robber flies we've got here in New York State. Uh, the most common ones I encounter are non-native. Uh, this is a native one though. Um, robber flies are pretty beefy looking flies, but twice, this one's about twice as big as a house fly. Um, but what's really neat, is I used to play with these as a kid. And what they'll do is they'll sit on their favorite perch, usually a branch or a bit of grass, and they watch things fly by them. And if they see a prey insect fly by that's about the right size of something they'd wanna kill, they don't fly after it. They figure out how fast it's going, where it's going, and they intercept it. They wrap those big spiny legs around it, and then they body slam it to the ground. And then you can see the great big beak under its mustache, that yellow mustache, that great big black beak. They jab that into it, inject it with the paralyzing saliva that liquefies the body contents and they slurp it up like a big milkshake. Um, so they're, what, and how I used to play with them as a kid is they're very powerful hunters, but they're not very smart. So I would find grass seeds that were just the right size and I'd sit by their perch and they'd always go back to the same perch and I'd throw a grass seed and I'd nail the grass seed, go to the ground, be disappointed, go back to the perch and I could throw the next grass seed right away and I would just keep doing that. And they never seemed to learn that. I was just stringing them along. I had no friends as a kid. Um, another cool robber fly, this is again found by Jeremy. Um, this one's called Lafria posticata, also one that's not very common in New York State like the previous species. Um, 
this one you might notice looks a little different. It is predatory, just like the previous species, but this species is a specialist on bees. So it likes to nail bees. You can see how it can get pretty close to bees. It doesn't really act like a bumblebee, so you'll, you'll notice that's different, but it, does, it sure does look like one. Um, also at Stage Hill, uh, an ant mimic sack spider. This is a species I've also never seen. Um, ant mimic spiders are very common in at least the Ithaca area. There's a European species that I get inside and outside my house, it's very common. And the picture doesn't do it justice. You've got to see them in action. Um, basically, what, what they do is their front legs, which gives them away as not an ant, they use like antennae. So they look just like an ant. And in fact, the first time I saw one of the European species, I was like, oh, wow, what kind of ant is that? Oh, no, it's a spider. Same with this one. The photo doesn't do it justice. When you see it in real life, it really does look like an ant. Uh, pine spittle bug. This is another species that's not very common in New York. This one's a specialist on conifers, as you can imagine from the name. And I want to point this one out um, also to show you what some of these blobs of spit contain that you see common in meadows this time of year. So you've probably seen these little blobs of spit by spittle bugs. Um, the ones you see in meadows are mostly a European species. This is one of the native ones. But basically what it is, it's the nymph of also called a frog hopper or spittle bug. What they do is they plant themselves on the stem of the plant. They stick their mouth parts in, where, which is a basically a big drinking straw, and they feed on plant sap. Now, plant sap has very little nutrition in it and lots of water, so they extrude a lot of water. Now, partially as a defense and partially to keep them from drying out, what they do is they orient themselves with their butt up, and they shower themselves in this frothy mass from their anus, which protects them from a lot of predators. Um, so if you uh, move away that little bit of spit, you'll see the actual uh, critter inside there. Um, here's one that I took, um, and this turned out to be the first New York record of this really tiny beetle, Sacotes thoracica, which we know very little about. It's a type of marsh beetle. Uh, it is just over a millimeter in length, um, and it was one of the gems that I found while I was out mothing, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, but just goes to show every little speck, photograph it, upload to iNaturalist, you never know what you'll find that significant. Um, this one is not a rare species, uh, but it's just such a bizarre one. I had to showcase it here because I'm sure some of you have not seen this before. Um, this is a type of stilt-legged fly called Renaria antonypes. Um, and antonypes translates to antenna foot. And that is because this fly, with its front legs, it pretends they're big antennae. And when it walks around on leaves, you'll find it in sort of dark, deep, hardwood forest this time of year. It uses these feet feet to plop around in vegetation. I don't know why they do it, but it's really quite stunning. And there's such a bizarre looking fly. Uh, and River, who's on this call, saw this one. Um, galls, galls are really cool. So what a gall is, for those that aren't familiar, a gall happens when an insect or a mite lives inside of a plant, secretes a chemical that basically causes the plant to grow around it. And that's what's happened to this hawthorn here. Uh, this is caused by a tiny fly larva uh, called Dazenura kratigebidigra. Oh, well, I mispronounced that. Anyways, Dazenura. Um, and what it does is it's this tiny little orange maggot in there, causes the plant swelling, and it lives inside there. Doesn't really do harm to the plant. And there's lots of different galls out there. And this is another prime thing you can document on iNaturalist. If you ever do document galls or leaf miners, as I'll talk about later, always document the host plant if you can. It really helps with identification. Um, speaking of, of bee mimics, we talked about the, the robber fly that looked like a bee. Here is a different type of fly uh, called Mulata posticata, another one that's not very common in New York State. I've not seen it here. Um, it's not just uh, looks like a bee, but it visits flowers and flies like a bee. They're very convincing mimics. There are a lot of different hoverflies related to this that you'll find in New York State. Sometimes they're even more common than typical bees. Uh, and they look like this to make it look like they sting, even though they're completely harmless and cannot sting you. Uh, a harvest men that I got, this one is called Leobunum, or no, I didn't get this one. Um, this one was found, um, I've only seen this once before in my life. This is actually one of our native ones. Uh, the most common harvest men I get, at least here near Ithaca, are European species. So it's nice to see native ones. Uh, this is one that's common further north. 
and down once you get to New York is is pretty sporadic in distribution. So I wanted to highlight this one. Uh, and then I want to round out some of the highlights uh, with a leaf miner fly, Phytomyza past in the key. Um, this was the first New York record for iNaturalist and the third North American record for iNaturalist. So a pretty significant find. River also found this one. Um, and this one is a leaf miner on wild parsnip. So don't touch wild parsnip as River's doing here. Uh, it can harm you. Um, it makes you photosensitive to light. So don't do, don't do what she's doing here. But whenever you're photographing a leaf miner for identification, there's a huge diversity of leaf mines. In my backyard, I've got about 200 species of leaf mines. Um, so document them. There's lots of cool insects that do it. When you're documenting it, photograph the top surface of the leaf, the upper under surface of the leaf, and make sure you document what host plant it's on. Um, and then last, I just want to mention a little bit about some of the work that I did uh, during the bio blitz. So I went out mothing. Um, and for those that haven't been to a public moth night that I held before COVID, and I'll hold again next year after COVID, um, basically what I do is run a light and see what comes in. Um, I did the Friday and Saturday night of the bio blitz, the Friday night at King Nature Preserve. I had over 100 species of moths. They're obviously not all in the system because I'm still working away at them. A lot of them are very difficult to identify and will probably will take me several years to identify some of them. Um, at Kashong, I went on the Saturday night and it's a reserve I've never really been to much, just once in the winter. Um, and I was surprised at the diversity there. Um, I had probably almost 200 species of moths. I still have to work through the details of that. Um, but basically I wanna highlight some of the really cool finds I had at Kashong at King. Nothing special there. It's common things I would have expected there, but Cashman had some surprises. Here's four of the surprises I had. These photos are not from that night, by the way. These are where I've seen them elsewhere. Um, but I want to show you the moths themselves, but also where they're typically found. And if you look at them, Cashman uh, Reserve, for those that aren't familiar with it, if you look at the maps I've got there, if you go to the N in New York, and go just a tiny bit southwest. So basically the far southwest corner of the end of New York, that's essentially Kashan. And you'll see that most of these have no records anywhere near Kashan, especially like the macrame moth. It, it's essentially absent from most of New York. And yet there it was, and it wasn't just one. I saw about three of them there. Tulip tree beauty, which uh, feeds on tulip tree as the name suggests. Uh, there's a few records for the Ithaca area, but it's generally very rare up, upstate New York. Carpenter worm moth, another one I was very surprised to find, uh, which is very common downstate. It, the caterpillar is born inside various deciduous trees, but hey, surprise, surprise, a female showed up with light. And the lost owlet, that's more of a northern thing and a coastal thing. Uh, it's caterpillars, especially on button bush. So that was another pleasant surprise. Uh, and before I bore you with more moths and moth excitement, I will hand it back to Mark. I don't know, Jason, you're not boring me. I could go on all night watching you and this stuff. Thank you so much. That's uh, just absolutely fascinating. All right, so um, I'm mindful of people's time and we still haven't even gotten to plants yet. Um, almost fortunately, given, given our time constraints, but unfortunately, given the huge diversity of plants in the BioBlitz, I have only a small uh, presentation from Michael Huff, who was our most prolific BioBlitz participant, mostly plants, he's a botanist, and uh, I will share with you a video that he made uh, of plants. Hang on a second here. I need to move my. During the Bio Blitz at Steggy Hill. <laughs>
that's just a snapshot. It's, um, and yet it's so rich with all these uh, interesting plants that I've never heard of, never noticed even uh, with amazing, interesting names, uh, including the bashful bulrush and fuzzy wuzzy sedge and the um, bastard toad flax, which I think we would need to get the backstory on at some point. I neglected to do that, but maybe I'll ask Michael at some point. So um, that, I, I, again, I wish that we had more time to uh, dus discuss plants in more detail. Maybe next year we'll program a bit more time and uh, uh, line up speakers in advance about that. Uh, I see that Colleen Walpert is here, who's a plant expert um, and longtime land trust uh, participant. Somebody needs to mute their mic. Is that? Okay. So, um, so that, uh, sorry. Hang on a sec. There we go. Am I, is somebody here? Are we still hearing the sound? I think, I think somehow the screen sharing has not stopped. I don't hear anything, Mark. What are you hearing? Okay. Sorry, I, I, have, I, have, I have interfering sound here. I hear okay. someone talking about trees. I think it's Michael probably on a different video. That's very strange. So um, anyway, let me get out of here for a second. Sorry. There we go. Thank you. Sorry about that little glitch on my side. So um, I want to. Um, so that closes the the uh, the the naturalist portion of our program. Um, again, we could go on all night, uh, and I'd like to uh, first of all uh, get to any questions that we have in the chat. We have here a few, uh, a lot of uh, sort of uh, sharing and inspirational messages. Uh, thanks to the speakers. Um, we have a question from Judy to Marla. What action do you recommend for invasive snails and slugs? Well, I do not like killing wildlife. I think some creatures should be dispatched. Do you have any thoughts on that, Marla? Well, I, I mean, I, I hope you're referring to the ones that are just the, the invasive snails and slugs in your garden. I, I think um, you can find some information through your, your local county extension office uh, usually they'll recommend things like sluggo pellets, which are just a harmless food pellet that contains iron, that uh, the iron is harmful to snails and slugs, but not other wildlife, uh, and surrounding your plants with copper wiring or copper, uh, um, a little copper uh, know, surrounds or copper tape is supposed to be effective. Plucking them off and uh, is another way you can get rid of them. But, uh, yeah, uh, I like more. I like to talk more about the native snails and slugs than I do what to do about the invasives. But I hope that helps you a bit. So on that note, there's a uh, there is a, a follow up question about any uh, from Simon uh, Wyatt. Uh, thanks, Marla. Any recommended resources for learning to ID mollusks? I wish there were better ones. Uh, our best books are have not been in print for many years. Um, there, uh, some colleagues of mine are working on the field guide to land snails and slugs of New York State. We're looking for somebody who wants to publish this. And um, hopefully that will happen in the next couple of years, but it's been, it's been a long project. Uh, I'm working on a new website myself that's going to have a little more information and some resources. Uh, unfortunately, you, you know, as much as you can buy a field guide to <laughs> birds, insects, uh, reptiles, uh, fungi, and everything else, that there are not very good ones out on uh, snails and slugs for our region. Wish I had a better answer. That's a, a it's a helpful answer in a certain way, Marla. Thank you. Um, so um, we have another question from Simon, which is one that I had myself. Um, which is, uh, would love to learn more about ant mimic spiders. What are they getting out of that mimicry? Does it help them prey on ants or is it something else, Jason? Um, I think that's part of the answer in that they might be able to hunt ants. Uh, at least some of the species do. I think the bigger thing though is ants are well known to be protected both by bite, by sting and by chemicals they secrete. Uh, so a lot of animals will leave ants alone. Uh, so you see ant mimicry with a lot of different insects. There are beetles that mimic ants. There's a lot of spiders that do it. 
There are some true bugs, uh, like uh, damsel bugs, where their nymphs look just like ants and act like ants. Um, and in some cases, these are insects that are herbivores. So I suspect it's more of a defensive thing. Thank you. Um, more questions for you, Jason. Uh, from Judy again. Uh, Jason, I just created and hung a moth sheet. What type of light do you use? I use the black light. Uh, black lights work well. The, the key thing is um, the more UV, the better. Um, however, if you get broad spectrum, that works really well too. Uh, and different types of lights will attract uh, different types of moths. Uh, one of the sort of the gold standard for mothing is a mercury vapor light. And those are the old style street lights. Uh, you can also get them in pet stores as, as heat lamps for uh, reptiles. Uh, you have to make sure though that they do produce UV. If they don't produce UV, you will not get much. But yeah, black lights are the nice inexpensive way to do it. You can get a black light bulb for five bucks um, and the ballast is, is super cheap as well. So, so black light is a really great way to turn. But if you don't even wanna go there, turn on your porch light. Your porch light will attract lots of stuff as well. Uh, obviously not as good as a black light, but that's a great way to start as well. That's, uh, I, I like the, the low uh, tech way of doing it, just the, the simplest way of doing it. That's a, it's nice to be encouraged to do that, although we might hang a, hang a moth light too. Okay, another question from Simon here for you, Jason. A quick question, um, uh, Marla mentioned ticks and mosquitoes were an issue too. Uh, a quick question about balancing observing insects with protecting myself from ticks and mosquitoes. My limited understanding is that permethrin only hurts things that touch the treated clothing and DEET just interferes with their ability to recognize me as food by smell. So uh, neither one should be hurting anyone I'm just looking at, right? Is correct. that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So the thing is, um, with permethrin, yeah, if you handle insects, that will be bad for them. That's a pretty potent insecticide. Um, with DEET, um, DEET itself, it's a volatile, but it really only affects their sense of smell. Um, and so it shouldn't affect non-target insects. Where you do have to be careful with DEET though, is it's not so much the chemical itself, but the emulsant that's in the spray, spray can of DEET uh, is quite harmful to amphibians. So if you spray DEET on yourself, do not handle frogs or salamanders that gets absorbed into their skin and is quite bad for them. Um, and also um, the thing with DEET too is you don't even have to spray it on your skin. You can put it onto your clothing as well and it does just fine. Uh, thank you, Jason. And so we have one more question, um, a follow-up question from Colleen uh, about what, uh, which lights do you have to be careful looking at directly? Um, okay, so that's, that's a complicated question. So basically, uh, you have to look at how your eyes work. And basically, um, our eyes pick up what we call the visible spectrum. We don't see ultraviolet, we don't see infrared. Um, and so when you shine a flashlight in your eye, your pupil contracts so that you're not letting too much light in to damage your eye. Great adaptation to have. When it's dark out, it opens right up and lets as much light in as possible. Now, if you have a light that is only shining ultraviolet, so some of the, what we call a black UV bulb, your eye picks that up as being dark and it opens right open oh. and lets all that UV light in, which is not good for your eye. Uh, so if you, uh, I see some young people here, if you like to go to the raves and whatnot with the black light or black light bowling, that's not good for your eye. Um, now, short-term exposure, yeah, no big harm. Long-term exposure, that's dangerous. Um, what you can do is wear goggles. Um, and I've got special UV goggles I use for mine. Um, by the way, I've got special lights that you have to get from Europe where they're LEDs, but they specially produce a certain wavelength UV light that's really potent and will fry your eyes really quickly. So I have to wear goggles for mine. Um, but yeah, if you can't see the light that it's producing, that's, that's dangerous. Does that make sense? That was very illuminating, uh, no pun intended. Um, Jason, thank you. So um, uh, thank you very much for um, all of these questions. And uh, we're nearing nine o'clock. I think that we should probably close. I had been hoping to have a big long sharing session. Um, I don't know what kind of appetite people have. If people have an appetite for it, I'll stick around for a while because I'd love to hear about people's highlights and people's um, you know, personal reflections and things. Um, and so uh, I would, like to 
um, uh, soon draw this meeting to an official close, but also uh, offer to stay around. A couple of things. Uh, through iNaturalist, uh, there's a way to uh, direct message people. And I shared my username and I'll uh, type it here. I am at wow so many. And I'll also send my email address around, which is uh, nativebeegarden at gmail.com. I encourage you please to go ahead and uh, share with me your written comments, your written highlights, um, if you don't wanna stick around for this discussion. Uh, there is a journal feature in the iNaturalist project. And at some point, maybe not in the next couple of weeks, but um, if I receive uh, comments, materials, just little short anecdotes or longer reflections or natural history reflections, I'll try to put them in the journal eventually. And we can try to do that in the future. Also, please, I uh, encourage you through these same two uh, channels to let me know if you have uh, feedback about how things went for you. I know that iNaturalist for some is a kind of new platform, difficult in some cases, there are some challenges. Mostly I thought it went very well technically. Um, people got their sightings in, but I know that there were some challenges. Marla uh, had to enter a lot of locations by hand after having done so. Um, I really thank her so much for that, but I know for some of the others, others of you, there might've been some barriers too. Those barriers, and then also the way we conducted it, uh, framing it as more of an engagement and learning thing rather than as a comprehensive inventory. Um, those are decisions that we made that we might be able to revisit in the future. Also, uh, whether there's an interest in doing these Bible blitzes like once a quarter, or once a month, or whether there should be a Bioblitz club, et cetera. Those types of things, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll try to compile everything and uh, bring those, uh, those bits of feedback to the land trust. Okay, so with that, um, Edie, would you uh, have anything else to add? Because I'm going to, um, given the time, uh, I will um, uh, close my remarks and close the whole plan program here, but stay on for people who wanna chit chat. Um, I don't. I just want to say thanks again to you, Marla, Jason, and David for your presentations. This was yes. really, really fun. And yes, of course, my, my thanks. That, that was just incredible. Um, Marla, Jason, and David, um, I learned so much. And now I just want to go out and look at insects and land sales and slugs and uh, fungi. So thank you. All right, good. So thank you very much for everybody, uh, to everybody for your participation, for your interest tonight. And uh, we'll see you around out on the out on the preserves. <laughs>